welcome back. We're on lesson four, which is scraping data. There are many ways to scrape data from websites. There are also many reasons and applications to scraping data, but we'll focus on getting text from a website for testing purposes. A good example of this is adding an item to the cart and then verifying that the correct item was added and that the totals are correct. We could only do this if we were holding the item and the prices in something like a variable. We'd scrape the name and price from the products page and then hold those values in variables. Then we could compare those values against what we find on the cart page. I'll use one scenario to teach you the concept, which should be enough to finish the rest of the challenges. On the products page, there is a drop-down that sorts the items by some criteria. The default sort is by name of the products from A to Z. But are these actually in the correct order? You'd be surprised how many bugs I've found in features just like this. But it happens, especially when they leave the sorting to the machine without testing it. Then a new item gets added to the catalog with some weird funky name that no one was expecting and boom! There's your bug. So, we'll make a test that checks that for us. We'll start with our feature file that's called productSort.feature. We start with a feature, sort the product catalog. Then I included a feature description. As a shopper, I want different ways to sort the products so it's easier for me to find what I'm looking for. This description helps, rather than just having the name of the feature, to describe what we're trying to accomplish with the feature. Then we use our scenarios and examples to support our feature. In this case, I only have one scenario, which is sort by name from A to Z. Given the products page, when I change the sort to name Z to A, then the products should be in descending order. Our oracle does not include that name Z to A is not the default sort. We're also not checking that when we change the sort to something else like prices and then go back to by name from Z to A, that things are sorted correctly again. To be honest, I would consider these different scenarios. But these are just a few things to keep in mind as we continue exploring the many different scenarios and the different paths in this simple website. Let's make a test file under chapter five called test product sort. This is where we'll hold our tests against the product sort feature. Now we can create our test function test sort by name from Z to A. And we can even leverage our existing login fixture. So then we start on the products page. Now, we could assert that the default sort is by name from A to Z. There's nothing wrong with having multiple assert statements, but we'll assume that the default is correct. Only test the behaviors and intent from our scenarios. That's really what we want to test. Adding any other small details like this would be out of the scope of what we're testing and belong in a different scenario. Back in the browser, we need to find each product's title or name inspect the name and we see it has the class of inventory item name. Now that's pretty convenient. I can use this class name to get this element in the console. We'll do dollar sign for CSS and then dot inventory item name. Sure enough, there it is. But this gives us a div element we need to get its actual name, which is just the text of the element. In JavaScript, we can do this by using the dot inner text property. 
There we go. We pulled out Sauce Labs backpack from the div element. We just scraped that. Okay, but now we need to do the same thing for the rest of the products. This would be a really tedious process if we had to do this one by one, right? There's only six products on here, but let's take a bigger company that has like tens of thousands of products. I don't want to be typing that one at a time, right? So instead, let's just find all of the item names and store them in a list. We can use the same selector, but instead of using one dollar sign to get the first element, we will use two dollar signs to find all of the elements. Hey, there we go, there's all six. But unfortunately, we can't just call dot inner text because this isn't a single element anymore. This is a list. So, we could use a for loop to iterate through the list of elements and print out the names. There we go. But we don't want to just print out the names, right? We needed to hold the items in a list. Now, don't worry about following along here. I'm really just trying to show you how we can do this inside the console. And then we'll do the same thing in Python where you can follow along. All right, so we'll start by saying let item names equal a new empty list. And then instead of just logging them to the console, we're also going to add them or push them to our list of item names. Okay, now we'll say item names, and there you go, all six items. But instead of the elements, we have only the title of each item. Obviously, this function is not as clean as what we would see in Python, and you don't really need to know this for the course, but it does the trick, and it is pretty cool that you can code any JavaScript in the console. Okay, but enough flexing, let's go back down here. Uh, the last thing we need to do is find that dropdown so we can pick a different sort. Luckily, it's got a, something pretty unique on it. The class of product sort container. Okay, back in the console, we'll use our same trick that we've been doing before with CSS. We'll use the type of element, which is select, but I want to be very explicit, even though this is grabbing the element we want, we'll be a little more explicit. So we'll say select dot product sort container. There we go. Notice how this select element has children with the option tag name. Each option has the value and then the text that it ultimately displays to the users. This is how you can select different options. But we'll do this with Pylenium. So with that, let's copy the selector because we're about to use it. So from quote to quote, we'll copy this whole string. And then we'll go back to PyCharm. Okay, back into PyCharm. Uh, in my test, I'll start by listing out the steps I need to take to satisfy the scenario. We're already on the products page thanks to our login fixture. So for step one, we need to select the name Z2A sort. Step two, we need to get a list of all the items. Uh, we want all their names though, so a list of all the item names. For number three, we can then check if it's in the right order. Now we just need to complete each step. First thing is to select the right sort. In Pylenium, whenever you're dealing with a select element, you can use the built-in select command. You start by getting the select element. So get and then paste. And then calling select. Then you can select the option you want using three different methods. You can either use the value of the option, the text that's displayed in the option, or the index. I'll use the text because that will make the test super readable. So in this case, we wanted the one that said from name Z to A. On to step two. Uh, I already did this with JavaScript in the DevTools console, so we really just need to turn that logic into Python. So we have our list of item names. 
This is just an empty list for now. Then for every item in pi.find, and what did we have before? Let me find this here. We had up arrow a few times, right there, inventory item name. So let me copy this entire selector string back to PyCharm, and we'll paste this in here. There we go. So for every item that we find, let's append, so item names dot append, whatever the text is of that element. See, easy peasy. Instead of saying dot inner text, in Pylenium you just say dot text, and that pulls it out for you. Okay, now for step three, we're gonna check if it's in the right order. But this part will take a little bit of explaining. We need to make sure that the items in the list are ordered correctly. But we need to do this programmatically. In order to do this, we need to have an ordered list of truth or the expected list in the right order. This way, we can compare the expected list against our actual list of names that we scraped off the page. If they match, then that means it's in the correct order and we'll mark it green, the test will pass. If they do not match our expected list, then we'll mark it red because it's not in the right order. We start by making a copy of our item names list and store it in a variable. We'll call this expected item names and we'll have this equal item names dot copy. Then we can use the built in sort function, but this time we're going to put it in descending order. Now we can compare the expected item names versus the actual item names that we scraped off the page. Again, if they match, then we know the sort on the website worked. If they don't match, then the items were not sorted correctly on the website and our test will fail appropriately. Let's run the test and let's see what happens. Awesome, the test passed, which means that it worked correctly. Now, we wanna make sure that we also see the test fail. So let's change this from true to false and then run the test again. Aha, it failed, which is expected. But if we look at the fail message, we can actually see that we got our Sauce Labs backpack at the beginning, which means that our expected list is in ascending order from A to Z. We then compared it to our actual one, which was ordered correctly from Z to A. So that's awesome. Our test passes as expected and fails as expected. So let's make sure we switch this back to true uh, so our test is ready. And I think we're ready to uh, refactor our test. Right on. Good job, everyone. In a previous lesson, we refactored our functions to a swag actions.py file that held all of our actions. That strategy may work for you but I want to show you another way to organize your actions and your code. Instead of having a single file with all your actions for the entire website, we could create a file based on the actions you can take in a particular flow, like checkout actions. You could also create a file that represents the actions you can take on a single page, like product page. Page actions make sense when the behaviors are restricted to a single page. For example, our product sort feature only affects the products page and it doesn't redirect us anywhere else, right? So having a product page.py file would make a lot of sense here. Flow actions make sense when the behaviors span multiple components, pages, or areas. For example, purchasing a product we'll call this the checkout flow, consists of the products page, then going to the carts page, then going to the information page, then the overview page and the order success page. You could have a page actions module for each of these different pages, or you could have a single checkout actions.py module with all the relevant functions in there. 
Again, this is entirely up to you. I could see arguments for either approach, or even combining both approaches. BDD and TDD will help you drive your design as you refactor things, but do what feels right and what makes sense to you. For now, we'll use a page actions approach to our product sort feature since that makes the most sense to accomplish our goal. Under Chapter 5, let's create a new file called productpage.py. Then we'll refactor the code from our test in Step 1 to that new file. Okay, um, I want to call this function, let's call the action uh, sort products by, and then from there we're going to paste in what we copied. Now our inputs for this would be pi, but then also the name of the sort. So I'll just call it sort name, and then we can replace this hard-coded name z to a with whatever we'll eventually pass in. Perfect, now let's update the test to use it. So I can get rid of this now, and I want it to look like uh, product page dot sort products by, and then pi, and our name, z to a. I probably could have just copied that too, but hey, do what you gotta do, right? Uh, all right, let's bring this in. So right here, import it. Perfect, there we go. Now let's do the same for step two. Uh, I'll do this one a little bit differently. Um, I want this one to look like this. I want to be able to say uh, product page, but I want to say like get uh, item names and only pass in pi. Now I still want our item names variable, so I'm going to do this instead. There we go. Uh, I want it to look like that on line 11. Uh, let's copy our code that we're going to put in here for step two. So copy this and then hover over the get item names. Right here we get a context action saying, do you want to create a function get item names in your product page module? Uh, yes please, just click on that and say what? PyCharm created the function for us. Dang, that's cool. Uh, this return none is just a placeholder. So let's replace it with what we copied. So I'll just paste it now. And instead of returning none, we want to return the item names. So return item names. There we go. Go back to our test. Uh, all of this is now obsolete, so I'll just delete that. Uh, and boom, there we go. Man, this is looking really good. Hmm, step three. We won't refactor step three into our page module because it isn't a legit action that our users would take. Step three is something that we need to do specifically for this test, and this test only so far. We could refactor it, of course, but it would be long somewhere else, not our page actions. For now, you have everything you need to complete the next challenge. The very last thing we'll do is to clean up the test. We have these three comments, but they're kind of redundant now just because they almost read like our lines of actual code anyway, right? Step one, select the name Z to A sort, uh, right here, product page dot sort products by name Z to A. So it's a little redundant, right? So uh, you can either remove them or keep them if you'd like. I'm a big fan of removing it if the comment is redundant. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. Uh, I'll get rid of this one as well and this one too, but I'm gonna leave a space here. Just then you can kind of see uh, that we have our uh, actions here, our setup is our fixtures. We have our actions and then we have our assert uh, and that should be good enough. So if you feel like you need to keep the comments, do so. Just know that it's best practice to uh, have the comments if it aids the code. Uh, if it's redundant, definitely remove them. But with that, I think we're good. So let's move on to the challenge. All right, here we are in challenge five, the last challenge in this chapter. In this challenge, you need to finish covering our product sort feature. There are three more sorts you need to cover at least. Name from A to Z, price low to high, and price high to low. We already have the feature file for this, so just add the scenarios you need. Then, 
satisfy those scenarios with automated tests. The challenge is complete once you submit a pull request, get it approved, and then merged. Before I sign off, I want to give you a hint. Many times when you're scraping data, or just working with data in general, the format of the data may not be the best. You need to make sure the data is in a format that helps you solve the problem. That means that you may need to remove symbols, even convert it to different types, and many other things. But the point is that you probably need to explore the data you're working with too. All right, I said way too much. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next chapter.